Welcome in to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. On this fine Thursday, you know, I told you folks we were kind of celebrating Halloween all week long, and I told you that we were going to uh, kind of observe some of the more scarier things. Today, we're dealing into some of the scarier things in my mind, and one of those things is AI. And yes, you know, I am, unlike... (laughs) Most of the time on the show, I'll tell you, it scares the hell out of me. I'll tell you this much. It does intrigue me as well. Sometimes the things that may eventually make you stronger do scare the hell out of you as well. If you remember on yesterday's show, I read an article about a project that has been launched to combine AI and DNA to revive your loved ones. Little did I know, and I had already started our guest's book, Uh, Edison in the Hood. I'd already started that book and I was reading that book, but I wasn't paying as close attention as I should have been when I had mentioned a name and the name from that article. And I know a few of you in the chat room, in our chat room uh, at Facebook, the Darkness Radio Facebook page, had mentioned how much the story had creeped you out. And there was a name in there, uh, Ray Kurzweil, that had kind of freaked you out and this story had freaked you out and you were like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't think I'd ever go for that whole thing of combining AI and DNA and trying to keep me alive in in a shell like that in some sort of AI robot shell. Well, guess what? In our guest book today, there's talk of that and they acknowledge... Ray. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're going to get a little bit into that today, just a tiny bit. Uh, so prepare to uh, have a little bit of nightmare fuel today. But we are going to talk about the subject of keeping you alive by AI after you've died. That's going to be involved in today's uh, subject matter. Although I will tell you, this book that I read is extraordinary, folks. So I'm going to get into that as well. And that is the main subject of today's talk and today's discussion. Let me tell you about our guest first. Nadia Udin is the winner of Slice's 2019 Bridging the Gap Award and is a graduate of Yale's Writers Workshop and has studied alongside esteemed writers through the Center for Fiction, Catapult, and a Public Space. Edison in the Hood is her debut novel. And boy, is it a debut. Let me tell you. She knocks it out of the park. To read more of Nadia's work or learn of her upcoming appearances or book her for events, you can go to NadiaUdine.com. That's spelled Nadia, N-A-D-I-A, Udine, U-D-D-I-N as in Nancy, dot com. Let's welcome her in to Darkness Radio for the very first time, Nadia Udine. Nadia, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Hearing you talk about your fears makes me wish I had like this diabolical Vincent Price laugh to to open up with. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's good. That's good. good. Um, I'm doing just fine. I absolutely enjoyed Edison in the Hood. And I what I enjoyed even more is the fact that you presented both sides, first of all, and you did give both sides pretty much as much equal time as you can. Um, You did present the side that said, hey, you know what? I'm not cool with this technology. In one of the characters in your book, uh, the Neo-Ludites, who are saying, no, 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 we're going too fast with this. Mm -hmm. You can't do this. And the side that's very much positive saying, you know what? We can use this technology, and it's not going to change who we are. We can use it to advance our culture and be who we are as human beings. And you do that through uh, Jay Edison, who's the inventor in this book and through Rena, who's his uh, assistant, who's been his lifelong assistant and many others. And stuck in the middle are our main characters, Aisha and Sam, who we'll talk about. We'll talk about all these characters here in a moment, but I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about this article. And I had forwarded you this article, um, because this isn't just now science fiction, and this is a, this is a book of fiction, Nadia, that that you wrote, but you also wrote it based on some of the work of Ray Kurzweil. Is that how you pronounce his last name? Am I getting that right? Yeah, Kurzweil. Yeah, Kurzweil. Okay. Uh, tell me, have you met Ray? Are you are you familiar with Ray? How did you come upon Ray's work, and how, did this fuel the book? It. It did. I, it's almost like I cheated because I so like 
took upon his predictions and attitudes and different viewpoints. But I started writing this book about 10 years ago. Um, a friend of mine was just mentioning there's this guy, inventor named Ray Kurzweil. He's predicted pretty much every innovation that's happened in the, the modern world. And I'm like, who is this Nostradamus guy? Like, does he know the lotto numbers? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Started researching him and just found that he was one of those pioneers in the world of artificial intelligence, basically technology, let's say that. Um, and I came to realize that a lot of the future, he wasn't predicting the future, he was designing the future. And I, I learned that there's actually a small subset of humans in the entire world that are really able to access this technology and design it and understand, you know, how it should be used. So, so much of my book is sort of that moral dilemma of, do we use it to, you know, build a better garbage can or do we use it to side, uh, you know, solve societal problems? And, and it was great to be able to be the writer because I got to present both sides. I didn't have to choose a side. So I got to indulge in, in both the pros and cons. That's a good way of putting it. Design a better garbage can. Because I feel like when you put it that way, it's almost putting it the way that we would put it if you want to say, hey, are we short-siding ourselves or short-changing ourselves as a society? Because as humans, we think, well, how do we do this so we can innovate but not overstep our bounds. And I think in our mind, we have a moral majority, and I'm going to use that word and I'm going to cringe as I use it, a moral majoralistic look at how we should use this technology. Like what offends the senses if we go too far? And I think Ray, in this article that we talked about yesterday, hit, hit that boundary because we bring, and we always seem to bring, I don't want to say religion into it, because it's not religion. We all have different religious beliefs, but dogma maybe into it. Um, because we bring spiritual, spirituality into it. That's what I'll say. We bring spirituality into it. Because at that point, we say to ourselves, okay, where does the mortal coil, where does humanity stop and the mortal coil begin? Okay, where do we as humans say, you know what, there is a time to let go and figure out when we stop being mortal on this earth and give ourselves back to the universe? Is there a point where science has to say that as well in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, we are, we are fear-based animals, right? Like you can even say spirituality and religion is, is designed to give us some sort of sense of an afterlife, like some sort of security, some sort of understanding in this, this state of chaos that we live in. So, so much of, of what we do and, and even people like Ray Kurzweil, you know, they are kind of driven by this you know, fear of death and what happens to me after I live and also fear of losing other people as well. So mm -hmm. you'll find a lot of the technology, particularly what you talked about in yesterday's article is about that immortality. Um, and, you know, as a writer and as an artist, in a way, my book is my form of immortality, a way for me to live after I die, having some sort of tangible object that can continue on. Um, and for some people like Ray Kurzweil, it's, you know, about, you know, unearthing the dead and being able to still have conversations with loved ones and maybe even seeing yourself, you know, have a very long life expense, expectancy. Sorry, can't say that word. No, it's fine. Uh, but, uh, yeah. We all... I, I, I don't think it's just scientists, Nadia. I think, I think we all, to a point, have that at some time in our life, we can't all claim to be spiritually secure. I can use that word and be confident in it. We all go through some spiritual insecurity at one time or another in our life. We all say, you know what? I don't know that I'm secure in the fact that there's something out there if I die. If I die tomorrow, I don't know that I'm going to end up some, somewhere secure, whether it be 
heaven or Shangri-La or wherever it is that I end up, I don't know that I'm going there. Um, we don't know that we're just not going to end up worm food. But then we come to a point in our lives where we have that moment, that moment where the light kicks in or we find what it is that we're looking for. And it's all, it's different in, in everybody's journey, depending on where they turn. And some, for some people, it just doesn't happen. Some people do end up atheists or agnostic. Um, and that's okay. That's their journey. Everybody has a it's different how, journey. Yeah, it's how they deal. Everybody's got a deal. That's right. Everybody's got a deal. And that's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with anybody's journey. It's their journey. It's what they take. So why, and I'll ask you this question and, and, and give you a second to think about it. Why is it that we, from the science point of view, are getting that push so hard to want to integrate human and technology with the idea that we have to save ourselves? What's the self-preservation here? Why is it such a priority? I think it's... I'm going to follow a little bit of what Ray Kurzweil says, which is it's part of evolution as well. Um, you know, these machines that we create, technology is really a product of our mind. And if you think our mind is nature, then, you know, what we produce is nature. So I know you and I maybe talked about like inevitable inevitability earlier, but it's kind of like, you can't resist what's going to happen naturally, even though, you know, that's why we call it artificial intelligence because um, it may not seem real, but, but it is real and integrating technology into our bodies and creating better minds um, I think is, is something that can't be stopped. And so whatever spirituality you need or religion. Um, it's about sort of coming to terms with that actuality. The fear of prey predator, um, something coming along that's going to be bigger than us that will swallow us up and eventually evolution will take over because we've been told ever since we were itty bitty in school that evolution is a thing that something bigger and better will come along and take you over. And ultimately, we're the, the top of the food chain right now on this planet. We've taken it over. But yet we're being told that something bigger and better may come along. Is this what is driving our minds when we think, well, we can't have artificial intelligence because we may make it better than us? Is this what is driving the anti-AI movement? Yeah, I think so. I think so. The fear of the unknown, the fear that, you know, we may not exist, the fear that, you know, we were once fish and now we will become once robot. And what we know is as our moment to infinity will go away. It's, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's spiritual. It's what you believe in. If, you know, either you believe in the evolution, you don't have to, but, um, but yeah, I think it's part of everybody's thought process as to like, well, what's next? In the book, you, you cite that the human being is a, is a funny creature in that it, it um, and, you, and you cite it eloquently in what separates a human being from a machine and what makes a human human. I can't quite put it as eloquently as you do, but there's, do you remember the chapter and the verse in which you, you figure out what a human is in consciousness? It's where Aisha, I wish I had it in front of me. I don't have it in front of me, but Aisha is talking to one of the chat bots at Jay Edison's place. And the, the chat bot says that they wish to dream. And that's their hope. They hope one day to be able to dream. That they can sort out things with logic. But they can't dream. 
And Aisha at that point says, well, the fact that you have the hope to dream means that you're on the way to passing the Turing test, which T-U-R-I-N-G, Turing test, meaning that they're on their way to becoming human or having human consciousness, which means they were already on that, on their way to, to being that, but not quite there. And there's a, there's a passage after that that essentially Aisha is, is talking about what separates humans from robots. And it's just that little step to the left, which is the fact that you can stand there in awe of the universe, but a machine can't, can't really grasp that what it means to be in awe of the universe. Do you know the one I'm, I'm talking about now? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, will a machine make an emotional decision? Will it be able to have that storytelling that comes from experience and memories of those experiences? Mm -hmm. And being in awe of things and not being sure of things is what makes us human. And, and it's almost like humans are a fine piece of art where, you know, the more replicates they are in the world, the more valuable the original becomes as well. So it's definitely kind of understanding, you know, do we want, machines to replace what makes us human and what makes us emotional? That's a question too. So with that, I have to ask you this, Nadia. If we are nothing but flesh and bone or in a flesh and bone case that holds a soul that has this, or a flesh and bone piece of art that holds this soul that has this feeling does it transfer over to a machine case that can hold this soul? I think that's what, uh, I think that's what people like Ray Kurzweil are trying to figure out. Um, you know, we, uh, you and I were talking earlier about just health and our bodies and mm -hmm. how sometimes when our body fails us, does that mean we, our essence is failed as well or, are we really a soul that doesn't necessarily need a body? And if that's the case, can we put that soul in a machine? There's a, there's an interesting theory and I want to see how I can broach this without broaching anything from the book. Well, you know what, in the, in the article, in the article that we were reading yesterday, I think Ray kind of brings it up brilliantly when he's talking about merging AI with a living being. Um, I'll bring it up in my, in my example with my shark of foot. You and I were talking before the show and, and my audience is aware that I have this condition of shark of foot where in, in, for those of you who don't know, again, look it up, Google it. Don't do it. If you, if you have dinner uh, plans <laughs> <laughs> immediately, or you're, you're sitting down to eat lunch. Um, but essentially my leg bones crash through my ankle because I have, um, neuropathy, severe neuropathy of the ankle bones. They, they go soft. They can't hold the weight of the leg bones. So the leg bones crash through the ankles. The ankle bones, they crash through the foot bones because the foot bones have gone soft. The idea is to catch the leg bones. It's like a Tetris game. It really is, uh, Nadia. The idea is to catch the leg bones before they go through the foot. If they break the skin of the foot, you lose your, your leg below the knee. And I told you how they solve that. They, they either do it with a reconstruction or they do it by pumping you through uh, full of vitamin D to, to harden those bones so that you don't lose that leg any further. Now, I've also been uh, brutally honest with my audience in the past and told them this, that if I had my druthers, because my surgeon's been very honest with me and told me that should you get your leg removed or amputated, You've got five years as a brittle diabetic. 
you've got five years. That's it. Because you become sedentary. You don't do exercises. You get prosthetics that don't fit well. And people go, oh, that's not true. You can find one that fits well. But you don't have unlimited funds to find them. So you get prosthetics that don't fit well. You become sedentary. You're brittle diabetic. Your sugars start raising. You end up getting uh, complications. And from there, you pass away. Now, if someone were to come to me like Ray and say, hey, you know what, Tim? I think I got a solution for you. I think, now I'm going to limit this in scope here, Nadia. It's a, it's a great what if game here. If you were to come to me and say, you know what? I think I can grow you a new foot and I can do it with nanotechnology and combine your cells with nanobots and we can do something new with the idea that these nanobots take on the soul, so to speak, of my my essence along with technology and grow me a new foot. We just have to take the old one off. But the new one works just like your old one. You can feel it. It's your foot. It's just that there's technology built in. Well, sure, I'm going to have trepidation and go, well, wait a minute. Can it go haywire? Will I start kicking people in the ass randomly? (laughs) Right? Or will it not work and I just have one leg now? (laughs) Right. Or is it just a dead stump? You know, will it stop working for any reason? Is there a warranty on this thing? Do I have to go to Best Buy to get it fixed? You know, does Geek Squad have to come out? There's a bunch of different questions here. But the idea is, okay, but I don't have to deal with ulcerations. I'm not in a doctor's office every week like I am now. I'm not in danger of that bone crashing through the rest of the way and having to deal with an amputation anyways. All of a sudden, you've given me hope. You've given me real hope of having two real legs again and being able to run and being able to swim. I haven't been able to swim, Nadia, in almost a decade. People don't realize that. I haven't been able to sit in a hot tub in almost a decade. Oh, wow. Can you imagine that? (laughs) I haven't been able to take... A hot tub? (laughs) Yes. I haven't been able to take a bath in a decade. I can't sit in a bath. I take showers because I'm not allowed to sit in submerged water because it softens up the callus in the bottom of the foot that holds that bone in place. So just simple pleasures or simple things that you guys take for granted... I can't take for granted because of this condition. So if you tell me, hey, would you be willing to do that? I'd think twice. And I might take yeah. it, you know? So there's there's a positive and a negative to it. And you cover it brilliantly in Edison in the Hood. You really do. Because there's there's thoughts to these different choices, right? But ultimately, there's unknowns because you're a, you're a pioneer in the frontier. And you go, but wait a minute, what's the price I pay? Is it the brain that runs the ship? Or is it the totality of the ship that runs the brain? And with that question, Nadia, I want to take our break early. And when we come back... I want you to introduce us to the characters in the book. And we're going to get into that scenario because it does start with a brain. Yes, it does. Yes. It's a very talkative brain. A very talkative brain of Aisha and Sam's mother. And we're going to talk about their mother when we come back and why it started with a brain and how this story gets kicked off. And I tell you, folks, it's an amazing story. And... I'll tell you this much. When you get done reading Edison in the Hood, it may change the way you look at AI. It's still scary to me. I'm not going to lie, Nadia. (laughs) But it's intriguing, a little more intriguing now. Our guest is Nadia Udine. The, The book is Edison in the Hood. We have a link to it in the description of this program. When we come back, 
Are we connected brain to the body, body to the brain, or is there a life force throughout it all that runs it all? I know that sounds so much like Star Wars. We'll find out when we come back. You're listening to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Our guest is Nadia Udine. The book is Edison in the Hood. And when we last left you, we were talking about the concept of the brain running the body or a spiritual consciousness running everything. And what is what? And we're going to get into the characters in this book, because there's an interesting plot line that runs throughout this entire book, Nadia. And you set it up brilliantly with the characters in our book. We have Aisha, who's a daughter, a mother, and a uh, in a in a uh, in a marriage, actually a crumbling marriage, with her wife. She has a son. Uh, she's got her brother Sam who's estranged from their mother and their mother has died. Tell us at that point what Aisha has chosen to do through her work. Cause she works with Jay Edison, who's this brilliant scientist inventor. You take it from there and tell us what she's decided to do with her mother. So she is presented with the opportunity um, to be part of a program, the Brain Reinvigoration Project, which would revive her mother's brain just long enough for her to redo that last conversation. So it would be a simulation of sorts. It's not like her mother would be alive. It's not like her mother would change her ideas on things. It's not that her mother can think about the future it's just about reenacting that last conversation. So it makes, I'm asking you reader, what mm -hmm. would you do if you were able to redo that last conversation and, and will you do it at all? And the story follows Aisha and her brother in navigating this technology. She believes in it. The brother doesn't. The brother actually has connections to a more subversive group who believe that this technology should be used in a very different way. And so there is that conflict between brother and sister. And the question is, artificial intelligence may solve a lot of problems, but can it fix our relationships? And is that how it should be used? Now, what's incredibly interesting about this brain reinvigoration project is they've chosen to it works on a, a, a couple of different levels here. So let's say I've got, my mom would freak out at this. I've got my mother's brain extracted. It's there. They use nanobots in my brain to communicate with her brain. So technically, the scientists involved in this can read my thoughts as well. Correct? Correct. Okay. Okay at least for the time that the nanobots are there, because you do have to keep injecting these nanobots in order for this to happen. So these don't stay in your right. system. So I take my nanobot injection, I go in, and I go to talk with my mother. Or at least what is the simulation? It's, it's my mother's brain as I understand it. Her, her physical brain but what I'm dealing with, is it her actual consciousness or is it just a tape that plays back from her brain? What is it that I'm dealing with here, Nadia? I think it's so much about you as the individual and, and using this technology as a form of therapy to, to better understand the past and situations and less about the actual 
the actual brain. And so the struggles, the communication struggles that Aisha has and her brother has with this brain is that it's not the complete person. It's not the person that has the body and the memory and the emotions behind it. It's, it's literally like a tape that, you know, you're speaking to. Um, and so where, what are we, are we just our bodies? Are we our minds to your point? Mm -hmm. Um, what exactly makes us human that even their, the mother needs to have in order to be her full self? Because as I'm reading it, I'm getting the idea that, and this is just my perception, this isn't necessarily what you put on the page, but again, the reader kind of drags out what they drag out from the story. As I'm reading it, it reminds me a lot of chat GPT. It reminds me a lot of what we're getting right now from different chat bots that we, we reenact with. In fact, I have one, I, I've told people on the show, there's this chat I, I downloaded this chat app a long time ago on the show because I just thought it was it was a lark. I have a, as listeners of the show know, I have a my my seventeenth great grandfather is a is the fourth grandmaster of the Knights uh, Templar, and they have this chat app that you can you can talk to different people through history. And wow, and so, but it's it's just it's just an AI chat app, right? And they, I'm more fascinated that you know your 17th great grandfather. That's more intriguing to me here. Well, and that's all because of my aunt and and her yeah. doing and my grandmother and and them, you know, keeping up with the history of the family. But in order to, you can go on this chat app and you can you know talk to Grandpa Bernard, Bernard de Tromelay, um, but it's not him. It's a chat app. It's AI. And every time you ask him who his children are or how many children he had, he'll tell you a different number in different names. He doesn't know, you know, although this is different in that it is Mora, who's the, the uh, mother in this story. Dead mom. Dead mom. Yes. And she knows who her children are. So that's part of the tapes. It has a knowledge base that never changes. And she remembers exactly where she was that last day she died. And if you push her, the brain will degenerate. It will, you know, it'll start to break down. So they have to be careful. But it just reminded me a lot of chat GPT. You know, I can, I can say, well, I love you, mom, or I love you, grandpa, grandpa Bernard. And he'll tell me, I love you back. But I never knew grandpa Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm sure Mora is telling her children she loves them. But it does, it seems to me like a very limited scope of this experiment. But you don't know until you go there. You don't know until you're presented with the evidence of what it is they're doing here. But when you look at it at first blush, Nadia, Boy, does it seem like a gruesome experiment to farm somebody's brain. Now, keep in mind, you have to do it with the permission of the family, right? Yep. But to extract a brain, attach it to wires, have a family member sit down, want to communicate with that brain, doesn't that seem kind of grisly and gruesome to you? Totally. 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 It's supposed to freak you out. Um, and that's why I think so much about the technology isn't even necessarily about the technology, like how it happens or, or how it's created. It's more about you, you how you interact with the technology. What do you want to get out of it? And I think that's kind of what I want people to think about as well. Are we just a product? a reaction to the technology or are we influencing it? Are we designing what we want the future to look like? But when we start treating our bodies like a 
renewable or reusable resource? Are we looking past our humanity? Yeah, I think I think we may even be looking past what a human being is. So one of the restrictions of the brain is that it's not living anymore. So it doesn't have new experiences that build upon its perspective, Mm -hmm. which is why it feels like you're talking to maybe a tape or a regurgitation of, of data and information. But really, we're evolving human beings. We always look forward. If you don't have something forward to look to, it creates hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there are limitations when we die. Because how can there be life after death if there aren't new experiences to learn from and to create your actions moving forward, your decisions moving forward. I'm wondering in your own experience, is it harder to get through to someone who objects to the technology or is it harder to get through to someone who's excited about the technology that it isn't quite possible to get there? Which one is the more flexible of the two? Oh, my God. I actually think the one who's resistant. And the reason why is I think what's so intriguing about technology this day, I mean, artificial intelligence is now just part of the vernacular. Like, every any actually, any technology is just called artificial intelligence, you yeah, know? Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. It's like, I guess it's the computer now. Um And what it has created is the idea that anything's possible Mm -hmm. and the imagination behind it. So maybe a technologist may have ideas, but may go into those ideas with like limitations, how it could happen. Whereas somebody who's resistant actually has that open mind and sees the potential And really realizes, you know, anything's possible. If we put our minds to it, anything's possible. That's scary. So in your mind, just your mind alone, is there a limit to where we should or shouldn't go? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I don't even know if there's like, a should or shouldn't like, I don't know if there's sort of this moral obligation, like, you know, it could be very black and white and be like, okay, yeah. So we don't want killing machines or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Like that's not good or whatever. But I think it's more about, are there parts of us as human beings that we want to even be replaced by machines? And one of the examples I give is art. Sure. There's, what they call generative AI, right? They can, machines can look at past art, look for patterns, can write books, create paintings. But do we even want that part of us replaced? It's a good point. It's a good point. Before we got to air today, um, President Biden had signed a bill having to do with government regulation of AI and certain safeguards that certain things had to be subscribed to uh, when it came to AI. In other words, um, if you were going to put AI into uh, certain military weaponry, if you're going to use AI for certain uh, industrial mechanisms, if you're going to use it for different things, that it had to have certain government safeguards. I'm curious as to what your outlook is on that. Do you feel that And let's face it, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. The government's always five steps behind everything. It seems like they're, you know, by the time you put a government safeguard on something, they're, they haven't caught up to any industry. The the, the safeguard they're putting on something is five steps behind where that actual industry is. 
do you feel like, first of all, there should be any government intervention in any development of AI? And second of, of all, do you feel like it's going to help or hinder the growth of AI? Wow. Wow, that's a good one. That's a good one. You know, we've seen governments, to your point, try to regulate or provide guardrails to what's what we can have technology do, particularly when it comes to cloning, genetic testing. And somehow the technology inches forward anyways. I almost feel like we're in that phase in life where it's like myth and reason are colliding. Like there's still people who, you know, don't believe in birth control. You know, they see that as like technology that's damaging. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the turn is always there. You know, it's just like one of those things where it's like, how, how are they going to be able to, to monitor it? And, and, you know, to your point, things like social media now are just getting the attention of the government and saying these companies have a responsibility to make sure our information is real and valid. But technology now is moving so, so fast. I can't even think about how they can even regulate it. I actually have a larger concern about the types of inequalities that technology creates in the world. So... You, for example, you know, we wear glasses. Yeah. I have contacts. Everybody has access to technology. There's sort of an evil loving level. But let's just say, for example, you get to put on a super leg. Mm -hmm. And not everyone has accessibility to that. Mm -hmm. And what advantages do those create with you? Does that mean that those people who don't have those advantages are going to be evolved out of existence? Does that mean gaps in, in wealth and inequality just widen? And we know that that's not a good thing for society. Those are the things that worry me. But no, my hope would be that if something like that were to, to be developed, first of all, that it would be developed for all economic levels. So the poorest of the poor who might be in my situation, because let's face it, when you, when you talk about diabetes, it hits all economic levels and, and especially the poorest of the poor, because we're, we're pumping our foods full of all kinds of preservatives and additives and sugars. And, and it seems like the, the poorest of the poor are the ones who are getting diabetes at the highest rates. So if you're asking me, honestly, I think it's, it's something that, if you're if you're going to give that technology to anyone first, it should be the ones who. Let's face it. It. it I'm not even going to go on that level. I'll, I'll tell you this much, Nadia. I think that that technology should be available on all levels of whatever insurance. Because let's face it, if you're be able to manufacture that technology, that technology is probably not expensive. I got to think that a nanobot technology is probably easy to reproduce. Things that we reproduce on a 3D printer, not expensive, right? So to do something with nanobots, I can't think is there, are, are as expensive as a twelve to $15,000 orthotic or 20 to, and the good orthotics, the good, the, the good uh, orthotics, or, or uh, especially for replaceable legs, we're talking twenty to fifty thousand dollars. So, an insurance company, from an economic standpoint, if they're going to sit down and say you're going to replace that leg permanently, it pays off better for an insurance company, even Medicare, Medicare or Medicaid, for them to sit down and say, okay, you're going to give that person a permanent leg. And if it's going to cost us $200,000 to do that, yeah, we'll pay it because it's a, it's a lifetime replacement. So economically, it makes more sense for the government to want to pay for anybody of economic standing to get a permanent replacement than it does to keep paying for a, um, to keep paying for a uh, orthotic every, uh, let's say, three to five to seven years.
Yeah, but uh, I guess it's going back to the government, like who's also regulating that? Because still today, really, if you don't have money, you die. If you don't have insurance. Right. I'm just telling you, you someone who's in the system. I mean, I'm in the system, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I'm, t I'm telling you as someone who pays, you know, who pays two thousand dollars a year for uh, for a, a boot so I, I can walk around. You know, as someone who pays you know, two two hundred dollars for a shoe for the other foot. You know that I, 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 I'm telling you from a guy who talks to orthotic makers who say, you know. If, if they were to ever come up with a, a way to replace your leg, they'd, they'd rather do that than, than actually a, a, an insurance company would rather do that. Medicare and Medicaid would rather do that than, than pay, continue to pay for orthotics because it's a, a one-time payout is much, much easier for them than to continue to, to pay for, uh, you know, temporary fixes. That's just money out of their pocket that they don't want to pay. So there, there's different perspectives to different, different things. And that's why I think when it, there, the, it, it changes perspective sometimes, like if you were to sit down, like I, I believe, and I, I get what you're saying with different things. Um, and I get what you're saying with greed, but when you when you sit down and you talk about money and allocations and who's going to pay for what it's much easier to put out a one time payment for a lifetime than it is to put out continued payments for people especially on a population that the government may or may not want to pay for so as far as an ai solution goes i think they'd want to pay for the ai solution that's that's just from I'm I'm telling you just from what my doctors tell me my doctors and my orthotic makers would tell me because right now they're telling me they want me to go in and get another operation that almost killed me five years ago six years ago oh god yeah because they're saying that's a one time fix and that scares the hell out of me Nadia. That is scary. And, and going back to, you know, the designers of, of the future, the, the small set of people truly who are creating the technology, accessing the technology. If you look at, you know, the entire world, it is a small set of people. And so where should they focus their energy on making a better garbage can or, creating yeah. a way for people to walk well, and, or and think a rock to the moon. And, and I'll give you another something to think about too. With the economically disadvantaged, you've got a whole subset of people that you now can test the product on. That sounds questionable. Well, I'm just saying that, that you know, <laughs> you, you want, I, I, it, it does sound ethically questionable, right? Yeah. But you want to launch a product, the greatest way to launch a product is to bring it to people who need it and need it probably and need it and can't afford it. And that's always been the way that our medical community has worked. How many studies are out there right now that you can, you can get a hold of a product that you desperately need, that economically disadvantaged people desperately need? How many ads have you seen, you know? Do you have this issue? You can't afford your medication. We should like to participate in this study. It's out there, Nadia. It's out there. Yeah. God help us all. So, I, you know, I, I you know, there, there's, there's something out there for, for everyone. Unfortunately, I think that's the way that, that, that's the way it gets introduced to our society is that it's, it is going to be the economically disadvantaged that get this technology first. It's not going to be the ones who have millions of dollars that happen to need, need a new hand. Or it, it's a firefighter who lost a hand in a, in, a, in a fire. It's unfortunately going to be someone who's economically disadvantaged, who 
needs a new leg or needs a new arm. And they say, well, you're on Medicare or Medicaid. And we have this new treatment. It's experimental, but we can give it back to you. Yeah, now you're terrifying me. Just saying that's that's uh, that's that's how the economic business of medicine works these days. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I I, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't mean to be the grim reaper of of the medical community, but I just. I mean, I I go to the University of Minnesota, which is a teaching college. That's where I get my. That's where I get my my medical. Uh, that's where I get all my, my medical stuff done. And they're a beautiful, wonderful teaching college. And they've saved my life multiple times. But you can't do that unless you break ground. And you get to break ground somewhere. That's just very true. That's just very how true. it happens. And a lot of times you break ground with people who can't afford those life saving procedures. That's that's just how it happens. And 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 I kind of got that feeling. I, don't don't get me wrong. I didn't misconstrue anything about your book. But the minute I read, you know, that, and then I saw Ray's article about, you know, combining AI and and all this other stuff. The first thing I thought is, it's not going to go to the rich. It's going to go to maybe somebody who's grieving who can't necessarily afford burial rights. Would you like to see your mother again? Would you like to see your brother again? Here's a, here's a poor soldier's family that can't, maybe he was the best, he was the best there was at what he did. Maybe he was an exceptional soldier, but his family, pardon my expression, doesn't have a pot to piss in and they want him back. The government wants him back. I know it sounds like a movie script. Who's to say the government doesn't come forward to the family and say, we can save him. Maybe that's how it gets introduced. That's definitely hitting an emotional core, if I say so myself. Well, and, and I don't, you know, see, this is the kind of stuff that, that keeps my audience up at night. You know, and, and the kind of stuff that when I think of it, when I see some of these news stories, you know, when I see news stories about fighter jets being automated with AI that, that, you know, oh yeah. And they're proud about how many targets they can strafe and, and kill. It scares the hell out of me, you know, and, and AI making uh, decisions as to what's acceptable losses and what's not. Things like that. That that scares the hell out of me. That's the negative side of the technology. But the... And yet, I, I read your book, and I see the positive side of it. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not trying to bring you down on this, Nadia. What I'm saying is that you wrote a book that has, the posi has some of the positive sides of it. That's saying that, you know what, there is there's positivity to it and there's some things that can really help with AI. And that's why I'm encouraging people to read your book because there's some very interesting arguments in here. I won't even call them arguments. I'll call them positions. I didn't mean to use the word arguments, positions. And Ray Kurzweil has some very interesting positions. And again, it's the, the side of the coin you choose to look at. It's optimistic versus pessimistic, right? You can use absolutely. You can use technology. A lot of gray in between, maybe. That's right. But you can choose to use technology however you want to use it. If it weren't for this technology that we have right now, you and I wouldn't be able to speak, right? As clearly as we are, we wouldn't be able to see each other. Uh, you and I are speaking via Zoom right now, so we wouldn't be able to conduct this interview the way we're we're conducting it. I mean. I, in the old days, I would have had to pay for a plane ticket, have you fly to my studio. We would be sitting, you know, across from each other, and that would be the way we'd conduct the interview. Uh, but through the miracle of technology, here we are, right? Technology being used for a positive reason. 
With always a dark side, right? Right. But then there's people using Zoom technology for negative reasons. Exactly. So, yeah. So, you know, there, there's, it's, it's the way it's used, positive or negative that it's used. But the idea is how do you get it to the finish line? And when you get it to the finish line, what's the overall use and have you done good with it? You know, has the good outweighed the bad? And have we, have we succeeded where we wanted to succeed? You know, and that's, that's, that's what I think is what's so scary with this technology. And I know I, I, I'm trying not to pontificate and take over the, the conversation here. So please, I want you to jump in. <laughs> um, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to. But you're doing so well. <laughs> well no, no, no. But, but this isn't about me. I brought you on the show for you to speak. Um, I think that's what, this is what overwhelms people and gets people scared about the technology. It's just that, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's the fact that everybody knows that there's this dark side to humanity. And in these days and times, that dark side of humanity has really shown itself. And then you put this powerful thing that is AI in their, in their grasp. And then you say, here you go. Don't blow up the world with it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and when you tell a kid, don't blow up the world with it, what's the first thing they want to do? Blow it up. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see how high this sucker goes. <laughs> you know, but by all means, okay. So let's 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 erase that out of our minds. Let's get back to the story of, of Edison in the Hood. Tell us a little bit about Aisha. What is Aisha's circumstances here? Aisha is somebody who had to grow up quickly, mm -hmm. had to take a lot of responsibility early, and took that into her adulthood, middle age, shaped a lot of who she is. And after she lost her mother, she realized that the only person she really has left as a relative is her brother. And they have a strained relationship, a strange, a large part because of her brother, Sam's relationship with the mother who died. Mm -hmm. And she just wants to fix it and she can't do it on her own. And that need to fix things drives her to technology. If I can't do it, maybe, maybe technology can do it as well. So we follow her journey and really understanding how she's able to deal, mm -hmm. come to terms with her past, have an understanding of, where she came from and who she wants to be while also dealing with a lot of resistance. So in a way she resembles also technology. And Sam is, is an interesting character as well. He's one who at one time had that love of technology, but things have happened along the way. Yes. He's also somebody who was involved similarly in in the world of technology and then realized that it was going too fast. And he started sympathizing with anti-technologist groups like the Neo-Luddites and has to realize, Hey, I can't stop this. So how can I make better use of it? And he doesn't believe that hashing out old relationships is the best way to use this technology. He wants it to help people. He wants it to go into to troubled areas, create resolutions, stop wars, help people. And the way, and, and again, no spoilers on the book or anything, but it's interesting how you use technology in this book to weave relationships together and show that it isn't necessarily technology that's bringing them together. It's just talking about a central subject that gets the communication flowing, which is, which is very interesting indeed. Um, the character of Rena is very interesting because with mom out of the picture, there needs to be a central mother character. 
why don't you tell us a little bit about Rena and why why Rena comes into the picture and how timely it is that she comes into the picture? So Rena is the assistant slash partner to this Jay Edison character. And I think she brings sort of that emotional representation to the society of, of technologists, so to speak. So motherly role in the sense that she wants people to feel taken care of and she wants to be able to always emphasize that what connects us is maybe a shared consciousness that there's a reason why we're here and there's a reason why we're developing technology in a certain way. So she kind of is the moral compass, I mm -hmm. think, mm -hmm. in all of this. Um, not necessarily taking sides, but supporting a more compassionate world. Which is good to have. I mean, especially when you're dealing in, uh, well, for lack of a better term, a, a chop shop such as what they're, they're dealing in. I mean, you are dealing with a lot of hard-based science, and she's really bringing the humanity to the science and reminding them of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and you do need that, as you put it, that moral compass to, to keep reminding you why you're doing what you're doing. You need it in any, in any of the sciences you, you partake in, because you do get that gallows humor from time to time, uh, you know, whether you're a doctor or a scientist or uh, yes. whatever it is you're doing. Uh, you get kind of lost in the sauce sometimes and you need to pull your head out sometimes and kind of go, oh, by the way, this is why we're doing it. Um, it, it happens quite easily. Um, and lastly, I know that you pull a little bit of Jay Edison from Ray, but there's, there's an enlightenment to Jay that kind of belies his station. Where, where does that come from? Because he really does seem like he's socially aware and a lot more socially aware than most scientists I know of. Most scientists I know of have been kind of had their nose in the books and aren't really self-aware and they're not really aware of the climate around them. Where does that come from? I think, so Ray Kurzweil coined the term spiritual machines. Mm -hmm. And he feels obligated or maybe is obligated to make sure that the machines sort of reflect our values as a society, equality, liberty, and he's highly, highly optimistic because he can only see the good in the technology. And he does have a moral, he does believe he has a moral obligation to, to temper it. So he may not think the government needs to be involved, but he must be also very trusting of the, the science community. Um, if he thinks that it can self-regulate. And so my character, Jay Edison, who's built off Ray Kurzweil, does have just well-intentioned optimism, I think. And for somebody who's so smart is kind of naive in that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of the dynamic I wanted to create with this character of being optimistic to a fault. I'm wondering in real life, do you, do you think that Ray sees through through some of the more recent developments, uh, the government using AI in some of their, some of their, you know, in some of their technology, uh, in some of their defense technology, uh, to be more specific, um, not just in, in, in the U.S. technology, but worldwide. I mean, it's being used worldwide in defense technology now. Do you think he's seeing that the tendency to want to corrupt this technology is pretty widespread. It's being used privately as well um, 
AI technology. Do you think he do you think he would be less trusting of his community now that he sees that just the general public is more than wanting to corrupt it? That do you think he still thinks his his circle is is absolutely pure? Or not necessarily absolutely pure, but pure enough? I think that he's probably lived long enough to know that any technology in sort of nefarious hands are going to lead to probably undesirable consequences. But I think he does still believe in the good Mm -hmm. and that the good can fight the bad. um, And that we can't get obsessed to the point where we're stymieing the advancement of technology out of sheer fear. And so I think it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, they're the hackers, the ones that are doing good and, and trying to stop people from compromising systems. And then they're the ones that just, spend all day trying to compromise systems. So it's kind of like, it is kind of classic sort of, you know, there's good and there's evil. And that's what's always balanced us through time. And we've definitely seen imbalance uh, in various ways, maybe even, you know, what's going on right now in the world. But we as humans have to be hopeful. Otherwise we really don't have much to live for. True. That's, that's, that's very true as well. I don't mean to keep don't don't feel like I'm shelling you with these negative questions. I'm I'm playing devil's advocate with you here, uh, Nadia. Um, but I'm I'm curious as well. You know, recently on 60 Minutes, you had the man they call the Godfather of AI uh, talking to uh, one of their reporters. I think it was uh, I'm trying to remember which one it was, but um, might have been Scott Pelley. I'm not quite sure, but uh, he. Uh, he basically comes out and, and says uh, the technology can't be trusted. When you hear messages like that, um, and and when you see negative advertisements, things like that, uh, you know, things like oh, a, a, a disturbing warning from the go- Godfather of AI, and and things like that. What are the first things that pop into your head? Do you think it's just alarmist messages, or do you? Do you put a grain of salt behind it? I think it's, I think it's a way him being the godfather of AI is to really almost not lose credibility by showing that there is actually a lot to fear or I imagine in reality, he's very much, you know, um, part of the technology, building it, shaping it. Mm -hmm. So I think he's fearful too, Um, but there's also no stopping it. Is there such a- So at least acknowledging it. Okay. At least by acknowledging it, by telling him we should, him telling us to be fearful. There's also acknowledging that it's going to keep going. True. There was, I know one of his main concerns was that the technology is growing too fast, too too quickly. um, And it is, there's two main arguments here. And this was the main concern, Nadi. And I think this is, again, one of those fears. One, the technology is growing too quickly. Two, they don't know how it's growing. So even for the creators of AI, they don't know how it's progressing in the neural pathways. They don't know how they're connecting and logically how they're connecting and how they're acquiring information and how they're acquiring these bits of information and how they're growing faster than they're supposed to be. So in other words, they're outgrowing themselves. They don't know how they're outgrowing themselves and they don't know where they're headed to. So they don't know how to control the growth processes of AI. In other words, we've lost control. Now it's going in this, this, this uh, 
area that we don't know how to control it. So, you know, we talk, we talk a good game about, yeah, we've got it. We'll control it. Don't worry about it. Uh, but we don't have control. <laughs> yeah, the scientists actually call it the rate of accelerated returns. And it is that the technology just gets compounded and, and easier to access. And it builds upon more, builds upon more, builds upon more. And, um, you know, you look at history and, you know, there are always those pieces of technology that feels like it slingshots us forward, like ice and how it changed mm-hmm. the world. And and TV, for those of us who are around when TV kind of came about, like, yeah. Yeah. must have been frightening at that moment to be like, wow, there's going to be a tube where information is going to be fed into people. And of course, it was used for propaganda, of course. Mm-hmm. But we still have TV. We do. <laughs> so... The fear always comes, I think, with it. Can we control it? Sometimes I feel like we just have to surrender. It's almost like, I hate to say, even like climate change. I'm like, just come take me, nature. Like, it's just so far gone now. Maybe we all need to be wiped out. (laughs) No offense to humankind, but (laughs) maybe we could use a fresh start. But doesn't that, uh, doesn't that go against every self a bit of self-preservation you have in your body. I mean, don't you uh, don't you want to stay around, or are you wanting to be assimilated? You know, I all I can do is is surrender. Whatever needs to happen needs to happen. So, um, <laughs> it's how I deal. I think it's the opposite of your book, though. I'm not quite sure. I don't think I read that chapter in your book, body. I don't know. <sighs> well, regardless, I do. Uh, I do. In- Encourage people to pick up Edison in the Hood. It's a very, very good book uh, with a twist ending. I think people are going to go, huh? Um, <laughs> yeah. I uh, Thank you. Yeah, I, w- I was very surprised by the end of this book. Uh, it, it is it is quite enjoyable indeed. Again, we have a, a link in the description of this program, and I, and I encourage people to go click on that link and get the book right now. Regardless of what you think about AI, whether it frightens you, whether you're encouraged by it, whether you see the light at the end of the tunnel and see this as hyperbole uh, the, the, or growing pains or whatever you want to say this is that we're in the middle of right now, or whether you think AI is a gift from aliens. I don't know. You can think whatever you want to think about it. Um, that's a joke, Nadi. You can laugh. Um, I think uh, what Nadia's book will do is it'll calm a little bit of that, that uh, anxiety you have about AI. And you'll begin to see a little bit about uh, some of the promises of it and maybe some of the side from the scientific side of it, what scientists do think about AI and where, where they do want to go with it, what they see when they're dealing with it and when with it, what they're working with it and what their hopes and dreams are with AI. Because I think it's different than what we see on, on the level that we're at right here. And we don't see what the eventual sociological uh, ramifications of it could be. There's also some sociological ramifications of what AI could do in this book that uh, you address as well. And again, I don't want to go into spoilers because uh, there's an interesting sociological ramification that you bring up with AI, which uh, could be very interesting. It's an interesting, uh, interesting solution with AI that uh, is intriguing. I, I thought it was very intriguing. So, but again, no spoilers, Nadia. No spoilers, yes. No yes. Spoilers. I so appreciate it. Thank you so much for allowing it to confuse you, conflict you, make you happy. You know, that's the that's the most an artist can ask. So Yeah. Well the the characters are are very intriguing. They're 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 very easy to want to kind of glom onto and get to know and and uh, and be part of their world and and they're very complex, you know, they're very down to earth and, and you want to get to know more about them. It's uh, it's just unfortunate we didn't get, to, didn't get to spend more time with them. That's all. So that's, that's, <laughs> then I feel like I've done my job. There you go. You have done your job. Again, Edison in the Hood is available right now. And uh, we have a link in the description of our program. Nadia Udeen, thank you so much for being with us today on Darkness Radio. Thank you. Great time. A- and it was. Thank you so much. I want to thank my guest for this week, Nadia Udine. Again, Edison in the Hood is available right now and available at the link in the description of this program. Go ahead, pick it up. It will get you thinking differently, a, a little bit differently about AI and the way we treat AI and 
the way AI incorporates into our society. I know I'm still a little skeptical about AI. I really am. I really am skeptical about AI, but I see the uses for it. And uh, I see how I could incorporate it if I needed it, whether I would use it or not. That's another story. I still have, I'm still really leery about whether I'd use it or not. But if I had to use it in a life-saving situation, I know I would. I know I would. So there you go. But that's me. That's me. Um, Would I use it to prolong my life? Mm, I don't know. Depends on where I would where I was at spiritually. I think at that point, but that's that's a debate for another time. That's something we could talk about on Supernatural News. Speaking of Supernatural News, uh, we we taped it earlier on a Monday because of the Halloween uh, holiday. And yes, it is a holiday, folks. I know there's a little bit of debate in the chat room about that, but it is a holiday. Uh, it's celebrated worldwide um, in different cultures. So we uh, taped on Monday, and there was one game left for Ziggy's Picks. So I wanted to give you a quick update on Ziggy's Picks and how the week shook out. And, of course, Bruiser wasn't here this week. That doesn't mean we didn't pick our games. Uh, We did pick our games. To give you an idea how the pups did, Ziggy was 9-5 and five this week. We missed one game. We, we didn't pick one game. That was the San Diego-Chicago game. It's not that we had anything against them. It was just one of the games we forgot to pick. So we only picked 14 games instead of 15 this week. Uh, but with that being said, Ziggy went 9-5. and five. Talia fell off this week and only went 5-9. and nine. Bruiser was dead even at 7-7, seven and seven, and I went 9-5. and five. So with that... Here are your percentages overall for the for the entire season. Ziggy's picks per, pick percentage actually went up. Ziggy overall this year is at 65 and 55 and has a 541 pick percentage. Talia slipped below 600, believe it or not, this week. Talia overall is at a, an impressive still 69 and 51 for picks this year for games. Yes, folks, we have picked now. 120 games this year. Talia is at a 575 pick percentage, which is impressive. Bruiser and Talia are tied in pick percentages. They're both 69 and 51. And I am right behind them at a 566 pick percentage at 68 and 52. So Ziggy is in last, but not by much. Believe it or not, there's only four games separating first from last place. Isn't that something? So again, Talia and Bruiser have 69 correct picks out of 120. I've got 68. Ziggy has 65. Isn't that something? Psychic pups. How about that? So we'll continue the social experiment, paranormal experiment uh, throughout the season. And we'll just see how that goes. Speaking of Halloween, Something kind of dawned on me as we're wrapping up the show today. And uh, we're talking about Halloween a little bit in the chat room. And and, uh, and we were talking about weather and, and what it was like in different areas of the country. Of course, people had nice weather in the south. But up here in the north, particularly Minnesota, Dakotas, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, it wasn't so nice. Uh, we had snowstorms in in uh, especially in in the Dakotas and in I believe even Denver got got snow the uh, the Colorado area and it got me thinking you know it was the second snowiest Halloween on record for Minnesota which we don't tend to get a lot of snow on Halloween in fact we had the one big Halloween blizzard in 1991 which was excessive, egregious, however you want to put it, in which we got a ton of snow, let's face it. Second snowiest Halloween on on record, and the second snowiest, by second snowiest, I mean we got a little under two inches. So it was 1.8 inches at the airport for the Twin Cities metro area in Minneapolis. But it was cold. It was just darn cold. It was, I think, like 26 degrees when once we hit prime trick-or-treating time, which is around 6 o'clock at night. Which has to, That's just too darn cold for, for most kids to be out there trick-or-treating. Let's face it. I mean, you know, it, normal average you know, Halloween trick-or-treat 
weather is about 50 degrees that time of year. So we're 25 degrees below average. And I got thinking to myself, and I, I kind of put it out there to a few friends. I said, you know, it should almost be a thing for municipalities, for states out there, to say, why don't we do a do-over? It's not like Christmas where we can get together with holidays or any other holiday and we can celebrate inside. Thanksgiving, Christmas, um, and, and I'm just using Christian holidays. I apologize here. I should be naming other ones. But where we can get together, gather inside, and, and celebrate the holiday and, and move on with, with things. Halloween is an outdoor deal. And I know it's rain or shine and you, you take your chances and, and play, place your bets and that's it. But why can't we? Why can't we do a do-over? Why can't we pick if that weekend after Halloween is going to be warmer, say 45, 50 degrees, why can't we do a Halloween do-over that next weekend? Because you know you didn't have as many kids as you were going to at your door. I myself had maybe 25 or 30 kids come to the door. And that was about it. Now, that, that's pretty high, but it was probably because the kids knew they had to take their chances and they're hardy Minnesotans. They threw on their coats, they came out, and they got their candy because they knew th that was it. That was their chance. But why, you know, I mean, I'm sure that was a pretty crappy experience for them. Not saying that we should coddle kids on Halloween. I mean, if, you know, when we were kids, we would have had to go out and do it anyways. But, but I'm just saying, you know, if it's that cold, why subject it to them? You know, subject them to that. Why not just say, hey, you know what? Let's give you a, a chance when it's somewhat decent outside. Do it during the day on a Saturday. Put your porch light on as a universal sign that you're going to be out there during the day. That you're giving out candy. Because who puts their porch light on in the middle of the day? And just let them know that, hey, we're available to give out candy for four hours. Like, let's say between if the sun goes down after you set your clock back on Saturday. Well, no, that's Saturday night. Sorry. But let's just say Saturday during the day between one and four, you put your porch light on when it's daytime. That just tells the kids, hey, we're available to give out candy. You do it during the day between one and four so that they know we're, we're participating in the do-over. And then that way, the kids get a second chance. Second chance Halloween. Much like you have second chance prom, second chance Halloween. I don't know. Figured, why not? What, it's going to set you back another 15, 30 bucks? What's the big deal? It's another second chance for you to get more Halloween candy. You're probably going to eat it anyways, right? What's it going to do? A little bit of damage to your blood sugar and your waistline? What's the big deal? You don't care, right? I know I don't. <laughs> So that'll do it. That'll do it for this week. Hope you enjoyed this week's show. I know I did. It was a good week for Halloween overall. Yes, the chippers are in torpor. They they went down day before the, the snowfall. I'm going to miss them. My little spud, my little wicket, and my little Logan. They're all down for the winter. So that's okay. I've got video. i got pictures. And soon enough, we'll have spring. Yeah, sh sure, it's probably eight eight months away, the way Minnesota works. But but we'll have spring soon enough. Got a little bit of disturbing news this uh, yesterday that uh, Dick Bramer, who is the voice of the Minnesota Twins, came to a fast mutual agreement with the Twins organization that he's to step aside. It wasn't a retirement. They just said he's stepping aside and working in the front office, which is kind of mysterious. But But the chippers like to come out and listen to Dick Bramer call baseball. I could always coax them out. If I couldn't coax them out with a, with a treats and tell them there were treats out front, I could tell them, hey, baseball game's on. And they would come out and listen to baseball. I know Wicket loves baseball. I don't know what it is. I think it's Dick Bramer's voice. I think he loved. So I left Dick Bramer a little tweet and let him know that, yes, it's not an X. It's a tweet. I let uh, Dick Bramer know when he left his tweet about retiring I uh, I let him know that there was one chipmunk that appreciated his, his dulcet tones, and I left a picture of Wicket listening to him while laying on the front step. So, 
just a little something to let him know that he's not only appreciated by humans, but by chipmunks as well. <laughs> so there you go. So I hope that you let somebody know that they're a light in the darkness as well this weekend. I hope you had a great Halloween. I hope you had plenty of kids at your door that showed off their costumes and made your day. I hope you made somebody's day this Halloween week as well. I hope you gave somebody some extra candy or let them know that their costume was extra cool or made, made your day. You gave somebody a compliment that made them smile a little extra hard, made them feel a little bit better about themselves. Because in the end, uh, even though it's a, it's a uh, holiday that some people think is a little too commercial, it, uh, it does make people feel a little special. So it's something to look forward to in the fall. It's something we all look forward to in the fall, I think. So I hope you had a good Halloween. Now we look forward to stuffing our face at Thanksgiving. But in the meantime, we can look forward to helping each other, maybe outside, getting our yards in order outside, or getting projects done in the house, and maybe we can help each other with that. We can continue to help each other throughout the winter, there's people outside who are cold and hungry, who maybe need that help at a homeless shelter. We don't need the Christmas season or the holiday season to help remind us of that. We can start that work right now, getting coats and hats and mittens to people who actually need that help. So maybe we can do that this weekend. Just a little note from your buddies here at Darkness Radio. I also want to thank Mally Fox for joining us this week while Bruiser was having his surgery. Again, you can't do this without the help of friends. And I want to thank Mally Fox for sitting in this week. She's always been one of the best of friends, and I want to thank her so much. Again, check out Strange Evidence on the Science Channel, or check it out uh, by going to Discovery Plus, if you have Discovery Plus, or check it out on Max. You can stream it on demand on Max. So thank you very much, Mally, for being our light in the darkness this week and helping us out here. For Valley Fox, for Beer City Bruiser, and for Jess Reberg, I'm Tim Dennis. Be sure to join us next week for another great week of the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio.